Hello and welcome to Wine Festival Online. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you indeed. Um, we are Susie and Peter. We're both masters of wine. Uh, we're co-founders of Wine Festival Winchester, which this year has become Wine Festival Online. So next up in our masterclass series today, we have got, oh, we've got Emma and Simon. So this is Hattingley Valley, uh, Hattingley Valley in Hampshire. And we've got Emma Rice, the winemaker, and Simon Robinson, the owner of the winery. We're quite privileged really to have them both, we aren't are, we? And we this, are. is, this is what I love about this video, is it's quite an intimate behind the scenes insight into Hattingley Valley. It We've really got Simon is. spilling the beans right from the start because that's what Simon does. Thank you, Simon. We love you. Um, what is he? He gives us an insight into his favourite. So he defies his marketing men who tell him he can't say what his favourite Hattingley Valley wine is. And so he goes straight in there, which and is tells absolutely us. fantastic. You know, and also, it's an interesting choice. It is an interesting choice as well. And it's a brilliant story about how um, the rose sparkling came into being. There's a little bit of, you know, discrepancy between what Simon says and what Emma, his head winemaker, says. I think Emma's right. I think Emma, Simon would say Which is really Emma's good. right. Well, he probably let's wouldn't. not go there. Um, but anyway, there is a lovely bit as well from Emma about how she first got into wine as a teenage waitress uh, and a magnum of 19... Double magnum. Double Magnum. Double Magnum. Of 1979 Krug. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's yeah. a lovely story. So, so but one, one tip we have for you here. So that you're going to be tasting, if you've got the, the wines, you've got three wines. Now, Emma, no. Emma doesn't start opening them until 13 minutes into the video. So what we would suggest is, forget that, get them open now, or at least get one of them open, get some poured, and have yourself a glass while you're listening to Simon and Emma. We hope we're not going to get into trouble with Emma for saying we that. We probably are. She might not see it. But anyway, um, the, the order is the classic reserve first, then the rosé, then Rose. the Blanc de Blancs. Three lovely wines. Get them out of the fridge if you haven't already. Definitely get them open. Get them poured. Start tasting. They are delicious wines, and they will open up in the glass as well a bit while yeah. we do the tasting. Now, Emma That's does your also... excuse. <laughs> It's always my excuse. They evaporate. My, my wines tend to evaporate in the glass. I don't know about yours. Um, but anyway, Emma does mention some winemaking details as well in here. Again, if you're unsure about anything, uh, please do comment, write us questions on social media. We'd be happy to answer any well, questions chat, you may have. You can use comment. the chat function if you want chat to. Chat well. function on YouTube too. Yeah. So, uh, so what we want to say also is thank you very much to all of our sponsors for, from today. Uh, this, particularly our headline sponsor, Rathbones. Indeed, yeah. Um, the video will stay live. This video will stay live afterwards if you want to watch it again or catch up on any bits that you've missed. If you're, if you're tuning in after um, the event, hello, thank you. <laughs> and there will be more videos coming up for the whole day, so please stay with us. Yeah, indeed. We do have some competitions running. Um, there's also, um, at Hattingley have a special offer on for these wines, so please do check that out via our website and their masterclass page. There'll be a link. Exclusive or, or even offers. Directly on their website too. Anyway. Um, yeah, if you have any problems, oh, email yeah. us hello at thewinefestival.co.uk uh, or also you can contact us via social media. We'll be monitoring all the channels with our team. Uh, any problems, just, just get in touch. So we will hand over now to Simon and Emma as they take you on a tour of Hattingley Valley. My name's Simon Robinson. Uh, I'm the founder and uh, owner of Hattingley Valley. I retired from my city occupation back in 2013 uh, when we had uh, already started working here but what we hadn't done by then was to start selling the wine and uh, so seven years on uh, we're now selling in uh, I think about 15 or 16 different countries uh, in 2010 with our first vintage we made about 25,000 bottles and our largest vintage back in 2018 we made just under 700,000 bottles so as you can see it's this has been a massive growth story uh, and the, uh, the, the story continues to, to date. We started Hattingley as a diversification project for the farm. Um, back in uh, 2000, the, the wheat prices were pretty limited and um, uh, we were looking to see how we could improve the farm. And I had quite a long-term in long interest in wine, uh, dating back to university days. Um, but if I was honest, probably not much more than an, an enthusiastic amateur. Uh, but I had also read in more recent days, or the recent days then, that uh, people have been planting uh, grapes in the UK and making top quality sparkling wine, which caught my attention. So it seemed to me that it was a useful idea to try and investigate whether this was a viable uh, diversification for us. Uh, to cut a long story short, uh, did a bit of research, did a uh, bit of um, looking around the farm to see what sites we had that might be suitable. And in 2008, uh, we ended up planting. Um, we planted uh, the, the 
sparkling varieties, the classic sparkling varieties of uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier to begin with. Um, we had a little bit of experimentation as well. We, we planted some Pinot Gris and some Chenin Blanc, which was uh, a mixed bag of experiments. The Pinot Gris did really well, and we've still got that. In fact, we expanded the planting of that a little bit. Um, Chenin Blanc was less successful, and the other three were, were pretty good. Like most people, I really started thinking, well, we'll make a few bottles of wine and sell it, and um, frankly, the thinking wasn't a great deal more advanced than that. People ask me quite regularly, what's my favourite Hattingley wine? And um, as the marketing men sometimes say, well, no, you mustn't, mustn't uh, mention that to, to put people off other things, but uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm kind of classic enough to say quite, of, and, and there's another uh, rather entertaining reason why I like to admit to this. Uh, my my favourite is the rosé. Rosé sparkling, I think we make a sensational rosé sparkling. I mean, it's not so I don't like our classic, I like our kings, I like the Blonde de Blonde and all the rest of it, but given the choice, I'd take the rosé. And the reason it's entertaining is that in 2010, Emma came to see me and said, would I like to make a, a rosé? Now, the account differs uh, from here, uh, because what Emma says uh, is that I said, no, 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 it's, it's not a very serious wine, a rosé. And um, that's what she says. I don't remember saying that naturally, as you can imagine. Uh, but in 2011, she came back again and said, are you sure you wouldn't like to make a rosé? I said, all right, why, why do we want to do that? And she gave me a few reasons, which uh, I thought, okay, fine. <clears throat> of course, 2011, we made one. It then won world champion uh, uh, sparkling rosé in the Sparkling Wine World Championships um, and of course my natural reaction to Emma was to say why we only made the number of bottles we'd made which uh, rather infuriated her at the time but uh, I'm glad, delighted to say that actually uh, not only is it now my favourite of the wines we produce uh, but it's very much a staple and one that we, uh, we will try to keep, make sure we are making every year uh, because it is such a good wine. My name's Emma Rice and I'm the head winemaker at Hattingley Valley Wines here in Hampshire. I first got really interested in wine when I was a teenager working in a, a restaurant part-time while I was studying at college and it, one, one evening we had a double magnum of Krug champagne from the 1979 vintage that was open for a, for a special event and I got to taste the wine and I was blown away by it and I had from that moment on I was Sure, I wanted to work in the wine industry and I have done ever since. I started getting far more interested, started doing the Wine and Spirit Education Trust certificates. I got a job at Oddbins, the, on the high street wine merchant at the time, and I spent, well, I spent the next uh, few years working in retail, restaurants, and then I ended up in New Zealand working on a vineyard in 1996. Just picking grapes, washing buckets, being general dog's body on, on the vineyard and uh, came back to London and finally got myself a job in the wine trade in London working for a Burgundy importer. I first found out about Plumpton College doing winemaking courses when I was working as um, an editor for Hugh Johnson's Pocket Wine Book um, and also was involved working with Jancis Robinson on the World Atlas of Wine at the time and I read about Plumpton College in those books and that really inspired me to leave London and go and study winemaking full time. I moved to Brighton and um, it was the best move I ever made and I've not looked back since. After I finished at Plumpton, I went to California for a few years and worked out there in the Napa Valley, which was a fantastic experience. Very lucky to have, um, to lived, to have lived out there. And then I um, did a cold climate vintage in Tasmania, the bottom end of Australia. Uh, and then I came back to England in 2008 and was introduced to Simon Robinson, the owner of Hattingley. Well, it, not that it was known as Hattingley at the time. he just planted his vineyard and the guys who um, helped him plant that vineyard put him in touch with me. And I told Simon that I could build him a winery. So uh, we did and the result is what you see around you now. Uh, we went from being a relatively small winery in 2010 uh, processing approximately 30 tonnes, which produces about 25,000 bottles, to one of the largest wineries in the UK today, producing anywhere between three and 500,000 bottles a year. 
um, of sparkling wine for ourselves and for some other vineyards as well. So for those of you who might not know the, the finer details of how we actually make um, the traditional method sparkling wines, um, I'm going to talk you through that process um, and illustrate it by what we actually do in the winery here. So we pick the grapes every year in September, October, um, more usually in October, by hand um, and they're picked into small 20 kilogram baskets which are then carefully brought back to the winery and then we press them very very gently. We have four different presses in the winery um, and we have numerous stainless steel tanks, numerous barrels so we can ferment each parcel that comes into the winery separately, keep them all distinct until the very moment that we decide we're going to blend them together. So the, the, the grapes are pressed, the juice is then moved out into the stainless steel tanks for settling. We chill it down to about eight degrees, that helps to settle the juice and we're left with a nice clear juice a couple of days later, which we rack off into another tank where we warm it up and then get the um, ferm fermentation started. That's the primary fermentation where we're gonna convert all the sugar in the grapes to alcohol. So the final wine will be very dry um, and with an alcohol of about 11% is what we're aiming for. At that point, then we will take samples from all those tanks, all those barrels, and we will decide which wines are going to be blended together to make the various different styles of wine that we make here at Hattingley. One of the reasons that we use barrels here at Hattingley is that we find that they give the resulting wines a really, really fine, elegant mousse. And you, when, you're, when you stick your nose in the glass of a, a sparkling wine, you don't want the bubbles to be really aggressive and to sort of attack your nose. So we find that our wines, having used all these oak barrels, we end up with a lovely, elegant and very refined bubble. So after we've blended all the wines, we then um, have to get them into bottle. And we put them in bottle with um, a mixture of sugar and yeast. So we blend these wines, we filter them, they're lovely and clear and they're tasting fantastic. And then we put them in bottle with a whole lot of yeast, a whole lot of sugar and mix it all up. Put them into the stores and, and into the warehouse and they're where they age for can, you know, maybe two or three years, maybe even longer, four or five years for some of the wines. And um, that during that time, the second fermentation happens, and then the yeast in each bottle, they die. The yeast, they, they do their job, they convert that little bit of sugar into more alcohol and carbon dioxide, giving us the bubble. And then those yeast sit in the bottle for the, the, the years of aging that we then put them through. And during that time, as those yeast die, they give off the wonderful sort of yeasty, brioche, toasty flavors up into the wine, which is the long, and the longer you leave those bottles in the, in the store, the longer, the, the more intense those flavors get. So after we've decided whether, we, when each wine style has had long enough aging on the lees up in the cellars, in the warehouse, we then um, riddle those wines, which involves us taking the wines from the horizontal position to an upside down vertical position, moving all of the yeast that's sitting in the bottle down the side of the glass and into the neck. And it all gathers in the neck of the bottle. And we have to get, then get that yeast out of the bottle and then get, top the wine back up again and get it ready for sale. So we, that's called the disgorging process. So we're riddling the wines on a seven day cycle, it takes about seven days for the wine, for the yeast to move from the side of the bottle all the way down into the neck. And then we start to think about disgorging it. And we would have decided before we start this process, what level of dosage, which is essentially a sugary wine solution, we're gonna to add to each wine as it comes off the line. So those wine, um, those bottles, they go into the neck freezer upside down which freezes the yeast plug into the neck of the bottle and then the wine moves along the line and goes into the disgorging um, goes into the disgorging line and it takes the cap off the pressure in the bottle which is at about six bar at this point forces the frozen yeast cap out but the wine stays down in the bottle with the with the bubble still inside the bottle moves along the line 
a small amount of this uh, sugary wine solution or dosage is added to the wine and then it is topped up. We put a cork on it, in it and a wire hood and then the bottles are shaken just to mix that sugary wine solution into the bottle and then they're laid back down again for anything between three and six months until we're ready to label them. So the time that the wines spend on the cork after disgorging is almost as important as the time the wines are spent on the lees in the bottle before we do the disgorging process. The ideal length of time is about six months from disgorging until you get ready to drink the wine. It gives it, it, gives it a chance to settle down um, and assimilate if you like and um, be ready for, to be ready for, for drinking. So this is our classic reserve. And this wine is quite a tricky one to blend because it is a non-vintage, so there's a lot of, uh, there's about 20 to 30 percent of reserve wines from older vintages in this, which are then blended with the current vintage. It's typically about 50 percent Chardonnay, 30 percent Pinot Noir and 20 percent Pinot Meunier. The best tip opening a bottle of sparkling wine is to try and twist the bottle, not the cork. and make sure it's cold. So the first thing is also to make sure you've got a nice um, suitable glass as well. A flute makes the wine, the bubbles look great, but it's quite difficult to taste the wine in a flute. So these sort of tu tulip shaped glasses with a point at the bottom for the bubbles to rise from are, are, are pretty ideal for, for tasting sparkling wine. And then you can ha have a sniff. Ideally, you don't need to you don't need to swirl a sparkling wine. The bubbles are going to lift the aromas up to you, um, and so you may as well just use the bubbles to bring the aroma to your nose rather than swirling the wine in your glass and risking spilling it. This particular iteration of the Classic Reserve is based on the 2015 vintage. Um, 2015 was um, Initially didn't look that promising when we first uh, started blending it, but it's actually has really come into its own. This particular uh, iteration of the Classic Reserve has 53% um, Chardonnay, 31% Pinot Noir and 16% Pinot Meunier. About 15% of this was barrel fermented and about 25% is uh, from reserve wine, so wines that are older than the 2015 vintage. What we're trying to aim to do is get a consistent style with this year to year so that when you see one of these bottles on the shelf and you buy it from, from the shop, you know it's going to reliably taste very similar every year and it's going to have that signature Hattingley style. This particular bottle was disgorged about a year ago, had three years on the lees and has had now had a year on the cork and it's really starting to come into its own. It's really settled down, it's very expressive. You can taste just the subtle hint of oak on, on, the, on the palate, um, but it's got some really nice uh, white flower aromas on the, on the, on the nose and uh, a little bit of um, apple, red apple, uh, and maybe even some soft like stone fruit, like peach characters on, on the palate. Really, really easy to drink sparkling wine, and it goes brilliantly with fish and chips. So the rosé is probably my favourite wine to drink and it's also my favourite wine to, to make and blend. It, it, it pretty much makes itself. The very first vintage 2010 that we did here at, at Hattingley, we didn't make any rosé. Simon had told me, instructed me very clearly not to make pink wine because it wasn't considered serious and he didn't, he wanted to only make serious wines here. So I, I very deliberately made no rosé in 2010. 2011 comes along, I'm sitting on a forklift in the winery, loading the last of the Pinot Noir into a press to press it as white wine to make sparkling uh, with no colour to it. And he says to me, Emma, I've decided that I think we ought to make rosé wine because, you know, I think we've got to, we've got to have a rosé wine. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. What can I do in the 2011 vintage? I've just pressed off all of the Pinot Noir with deliberately getting no colour from it so I can make white wine, white sparkling wine from it. But I had one tank of Pinot Noir that had been very ripe and it didn't, I couldn't press it white. It came out with a, naturally out with a lot of colour. 
So I was able to use that and make a small amount of rosé in 2011. I made about 2,000 bottles. And then that wine, when we released it in 2014, went on to win World Champion Vintage Rosé at the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championships. We pretty much sold out of the wine by the time it won that award. Uh, and then Simon turned around to me and came and said, why didn't we make any more of the rosé? Um, because it's just won this big award and everyone wants to buy it. And, and from that moment on, we decided that we were going to make rosé every year. And I had much more, um, much more, many more options to choose from in going forward because I knew from the beginning of the harvest what I was going to be doing. So to blend this particular wine, the rosé, we're looking for um, strawberries and cream is essentially the palette that I'm looking for in our rosé. So I'm looking in the tanks of the Pinot Noir and the Pinot Meunier only, the two black grapes that we, we process. Um, and I'm looking for really, really bright fruit characters. So very, very little malolactic fermentation in this wine, maybe about 10%. So we're looking for raspberries, strawberries, possibly some cherries, apricots. We get that from the Pinot Meunier. And I want the bright fruit characters. Blend those together with about 10% of barrel fermented Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier. And that barrel ferment adds the cream. So we have the, the, the bright fruit of the strawberries from the tank fermented samples, uh, um, parcels. And then we have the cream element that comes from the barrel fermented parts of the wine. And to get that delicate pink colour, we use a, a variety called Pinot Noir Precoce and we make a red wine from that and we blend it back in tiny proportions just to get the colour to the very, very delicate pink that you, you'll see in your glass today. 2017 was a very small vintage for Hattingley and across the country really it was a frost year. So the crop had been um, heavily reduced in April by a hard frost that wiped out considerable portion of the buds on the vines at that very early stage of proceedings. So that what we got in into the winery in uh, October of 2017 was a very small crop, but very ripe. So the color is a coppery pink, very bronzy color, very, very delicate. And it's bursting with breadfruit characters. Two thousand and seventeen, quite a quite a recent vintage. So this has had two years on leaves, and then we just gorged it earlier in um, this summer in two thousand and twenty. Had about six months on the cork at this point. Um, it's as I say, it's one of my favourite wines. It's the favourite one to blend, it's the favourite one to taste. And this goes brilliantly with caviar um, served on blinis before you, as an aperitif, before you have your main course. The Blanc de Blanc wine uh, is 100% Chardonnay. It's, Blanc de Blanc means white wine made from white grapes. And it is another joy to make in the winery when we're coming to the blending because I get to cherry pick the very finest Chardonnay parcels. Again, about 10% of this is barrel fermented. Um, and the rest comes from stainless steel tanks. It will go through partial malolactic fermentation and um, I'm just looking for the purest expression of Chardonnay from the very, very best parcels that come into the winery. And most of the fruit that goes into this particular wine will have gone through our Cocar Champagne Press, which is a particular type of whole bunch uh, pressing designed for use in champagne and for making high quality sparkling wines. The Blanc de Blanc, because it's from the Chardonnay, it has a higher acidity. Um, it needs a lot longer on the lees to aging to really come out of itself, really to begin to express itself. Um, this wine has spent four years on lees and then this particular bottle here has uh, had two years on the cork, which is uh, an extreme amount of time on the cork, but it pays dividends to do that. And we have, and the, the wine itself is very, very expressive and um, really, really speaks of where it comes from, which is essentially the chalk hills of the South Downs here in, um, in Sussex, Hampshire. 
the 2013 Blanc de Blanc. 2013 was a very tricky vintage for us, well, for the entire country. It was very wet, it was cold, the vintage was late, uh, it rained incessantly, and at the end of October, we still hadn't got all the Chardonnay in to the winery. And Storm Sandy was due to hit the south coast of England, and boy, did it hit. So that weekend of the 31st of October in 2013, we had tons and tons of Chardonnay arriving at the winery as everybody started picking furiously in an attempt to get it in before the storm hit. One of the hardest vintages I've ever had to work here at Hattingley, but the result is worth it. This is the last wine from the 2013 vintage that we still have in the cellars. It's got a lovely toasty character that comes from that extended lees aging. This particular vintage, 2013, which is uh, an unusual for us because of that cold, uh, wet weather towards the end of harvest, the acidity was pretty high. So we put the entire vintage, the entire batch of Chardonnay for this through malolactic fermentation. We added a dosage at um, at, after the lees aging period of six grams per liter. Um, and after being aged on lees for four years, it's got a delicious toasty character to it. Still got a very vibrant acidity, which is, keeps that wine alive. And that's what allows you to age these Blanc de Blancs for such a long time and to keep enjoying them for many years, even after disgorging. Well, thank you for watching this special masterclass that we filmed for the Wine Festival Winchester. It's a shame we can't all be at the Guild Hall again this year. Circumstances uh, self-explanatory. Um, I hope you enjoyed the wines and learning a bit about what we do here at Hattingley to make them. If you hadn't already bought the wines and this has inspired you to do so, please follow the link on the uh, Wine Festival Winchester uh, communications that you've had about this masterclass and that will take you to special offer for these three, three wines on our website.